greetings all. Joseph Kursky here. I'm on the S3 education team. We'll talk about that in a moment, but I'm really glad that you folks have chosen uh, this time. I know it's uh, late in the day for you and I'm in Colorado uh, and I really was hoping that uh, Ashok and I could come down and see you today um, as we originally planned, but things happen and our world is a dynamic planet as we all know and that's one of the reasons why we're using geotechnologies to try to understand not only the situation that we're in right now but other issues uh, that are changing over space and time. That is exactly what we're, we're all about today. So even though we couldn't have the face-to-face -face chat and uh, live demonstration and a workshop, hopefully this is the next best thing. And hopefully it's not just a, 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 a not a cancellation, but rather a postponement. So hopefully I can come down there in the next academic year when we're hope to be face-to-face uh, -face once again, okay? Uh, uh, Dr. Bouchera, do you wanna uh, say a few words here? It's your, it's your institution, so feel free to have some introductory comments here. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody that uh, did show up and join. Dr. K has been very, very instrumental in helping us <clears throat> guide our program, and now we're looking to make that next step to where GIS at the institution is no longer just for student learning. It is also for facility management, research, so often that we lose track of our students because we don't know where they are. And half of what we do is understanding where they are and we can benefit them better by understanding where they are, the environments they live in, the demographics in which make up our institution, not just students, but faculty and staff. So um, I'd like to thank Dr. K for uh, being a part of this. Um, I would also like to introduce to the newcomers to the group, Mr. Ashuk Adwani. He is the chairman of our GIS advisory board. And I don't know if I'd have been able to do half the stuff I've done over the last three years without his input. So introduce yourself, Mr. Ashuk. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Dr. K. Sir, thanks, Michael. Appreciate your comments. And um, as you guys know, I love GIS and my biggest challenge is to get this going in high schools and even above. So I'm still pitching in even after retirement. And I look forward to continuing this relationship with uh, educational institutions and uh, hope uh, we can help as much as we can. I'm, I'm certainly in favor of uh, GIS becoming a you know, like a mandatory subject. And uh, one of these days, hopefully in our lifetime, we'll see that. But beyond that, I just wanted to make uh, Joseph uh, come down, which didn't happen, of course, but at least at this stage to have a uh, face to face face sort of a meeting to go over some of the uh, issues or what's new in GIS and what Joseph can certainly share with you, uh, Michael, to promote your program. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joseph. Thanks, Ashok. Uh, it's good to see you again on, on here. Folks, Ashok Wadwani is, in my opinion, exactly why many of us are so passionate about GIS. Yes, we love the tools. Yes, we love the data, but it's the people. Ashok being a perfect example is the people are very passionate about helping others ramp up into geotechnologies. Now, just a word about that. It, in 2004, the U.S. Department of Labor said there are three hot growing fields, as Michael is well aware of as well, for the 21st century. Nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, and geotechnologies. And the geotechnologies are what we're all about today. The geotechnologies includes web mapping, web mapping applications. And at no time than the past month have web mapping applications, dashboards, maps, and uh, infographics such as these been so much in the public sphere, right? When counties and cities and states and countries set up dashboards like this, this all comes from web mapping applications from geotechnologies. So maps and apps are part of it. Remote sensing, looking at the world from space, GPS or GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems or Global Positioning Systems. And all of these things in 2D and in 3D help us to understand our world. 
uh, whether it's in facilities management or transportation or health or natural resources or city planning, uh, et cetera. All of these uh, fields actually take advantage of GIS or geotechnologies because they all have to do with the whys of where. It's all about not just where things are, but why do they have the patterns that they do. So I really salute all of you. And I, again, I think Ashok is one of the, a, a great example of why we care about this because he's, as he said, uh, you know, very successful businessman. He's got his his retirement now. He could be, you know, sitting on the, you know, the dock of the bay, or out hiking somewhere, you know, distancing himself, of course. But he's choosing to uh, stay involved with education, which is is very much appreciated, Ashok, because it is a team effort. We all bring something uh, to the education enterprise, and we really uh, feel for you folks in education right now. Uh, my team, which is the ESRI education team. So if you go to ESRI.com, for example, uh, if you look at our page, it is uh, really about these three things. And, you know, front and center on the page right now, as you can see, is um, the, the current situation that we're in. The, the organization that I'm a part of is helping organizations, counties, cities, other, other government agencies, private industry, and others set up these dashboards and maps so people can make smarter and wiser decisions. But about the organization itself, it's really these three things, folks, and I'm just going to go ahead and reduce the resolution just a little bit here. Let's go to this About tab. Uh, just so you know where I'm coming from, I'm a geographer. I work on the education team here at ESRI. I also teach in a couple of uh, universities because, like Michael, I love teaching. So I'm teaching at North Park University, Elmhurst College. I teach at the University of Denver, all online, uh, because my regular job is actually to serve on this education team. But our organization's mission is the three things that you see here, education, sustainability, and science. So the team that I'm on, which, which is, and I could put these things in the chat box. The team that I'm on, education team, is all about supporting you all in higher education. And in, as Ashok mentioned also, we have a, we have a, a very significant uh, outreach effort to primary and secondary schools as well. That actually will feed your, uh, your college. But the point is, um, we know that geotechnologies, is a, it's, a, it's a set of tools, really, and a set of data and a way of thinking it's really a way of thinking about things over space, changes over space and time. And that being said, okay, you've got to carefully weigh what you're going to do research with and teach with at, at your college, right? So how do you do that? This is a professional tool that we want students to actually use while they're still in school, as Ashok mentioned. And the reason why is because it fosters critical and spatial thinking and analytical ways of thinking. It also touches nicely on computer science. So having students use Python, JavaScript, etc. So for all those reasons and more, we want to have a team, and we've done, been doing this since 1992, so it's not like we you know, woke up yesterday and said, hey, we should work with educators because we'd like Michael. What's not to love? No, it's actually because we really believe that students really need to be engaged in these tools because of several reasons. One, most students really do want a meaningful career. Right? They actually want to make a difference in the planet and in their own communities. And number two, wherever they go, health, transportation, city planning, natural resource management, whatever, uh, public safety, health care, they're going to be asking the where question. And they're going to be using geotechnologies to help them to answer those whys of where questions. So we feel that this is a, an excellent tool for students. Even if they don't become GIS analysts or GIS technicians or GIS managers, that's OK. They're going to be working as a natural resource planner or as a public health person or a, a police sergeant. And they're going to be wanting to use maps in analytical ways. And so we'll touch on also in facilities management here in a bit. But anyway, our team, think of us as your partners in, in industry to help you. How do, I, how do I teach with this? How do I do research with this stuff? Because it's not educational software. It's actually software that's being used in, in industry, government, private industry, nonprofits, et cetera, in academia. So that's what our role is, to help you be successful with this. So please uh, take advantage of... Uh, our team, and we always learn a great deal working with 
all of you in higher education. I have this contact information. This is a, a bit of a geeky photo, but um, I've got my contact information there. Please feel free to get in touch with me. Michael knows how to get a hold of me, and Ashok does as well. So that all being said, being sensitive to your time, I really want to focus on a couple of things that might be useful, and just to get you thinking about where GIS, Geographic Information Systems, has been, where it's going, how you can position this at HCC for student success. Okay, uh, but let me pause there. Questions, comments at this point? I've got a we've got a chat box here. We can we can um, access. Let me just pull that up and make sure that. If anybody's, we've got a small group too, so feel free to unmute yourself and uh, uh, just be be in audio mode. All right, be thinking about um, what kinds of questions you might want to ask me at some point here. Uh, I have let a me quick question. I have a quick yes. question for you, Dr. Keg, just to give everybody a brief overview. <clears throat> You're saying that this software is an industry software, but didn't it get its roots within research? Yes, that's a very good point. Um, okay, without boring you to tears, folks, uh, we kind of geek out on the history of geospatial technology. It goes back around 52 years, 53 years, back to the late 1960s. Uh, Roger Tomlinson, who was a researcher in Canada, um, had a, a big challenge. How do we most effectively develop lands in Canada? Big country. We're not going to do that very effectively with a bunch of paper maps. We've got to figure out what is the most arable land, which is the most suitable for forestry, which is the most suitable for agriculture, which is the most suitable for just pre preservation of wetlands, etc. So a geographic information system was designed to help people make smarter decisions in, in the research field. Yes, so overlaying different layers Think of the old-fashioned transparencies. Maybe I'm dating myself, but you've got a layer of forest. You've got a layer of urban area. You've got a layer of different zoning in Houston. You've got a layer of uh, the hydrography, uh, flood potential, population change, infrastructure, so buildings, a layer of gas pipelines, a layer of electricity, a layer of you know water mains, etc. So all these things in these layers that are geospatially referenced, and so you can make um, – ties to the different uh, components, the different, again, think of that old overhead transparency sort of analogy. So you're exactly right, Michael. Uh, that's exactly where it got its start. And most of the geospatial um, work in education is really in research, although Ashok and I and others really want to see it being taught with in, hey, I've got a, I've got a marketing 101 course. It's all about location. Shouldn't I be using geotechnologies in that course? And we say, yes, you absolutely should. Or I've got a transportation planning course, or I've got a business course, or I've, uh, you know, a, a, a business management, a supply chain management. I've got a, uh, you know, a, a course in um, uh, weather and climate. Okay, that's space and time. So this has a lot of applicability in lots of different uh, fields, research and teaching, and also in campus administration that we'll talk about here in a bit. Okay, uh, let me just lay out um, two groups of five things. First of all, the five forces that I think are really important for us to just mention. Not, don't worry, I'm not going to spend an hour talking about these things uh, because I really want to get to you, you know your concerns. But I just believe that things like that you see on the screen here are really important for considering using geotechnologies in an expanded way at HCC. One of them is geo awareness. You know, students faculty, deans, staff, others, general public even, are more aware of the kinds of issues that we've been chatting about. Well, not just the current health situation, but floods, hurricanes, right? Wildfires, uh, population growth, uh, sustainable agriculture. All these issues are really core to the whys of where. And so the, the general public's awareness, I think, has been an all, at an all-time high. And I've known Ashok since, since the 1990s. And we used to say, gosh, wouldn't it be great if a lot of people actually – you know, started thinking about these issues. And actually, we're getting to the point where a lot of people in the general population 
they don't always tie it to geotechnologies, but at least it's in the public consciousness now more than ever before. So I think that's that's a good trend. Also, people are enabled, that geo enablement, they're enabled to use at least some of the geotechnologies, even on their phone, to find the library at HCC or to find the nearest coffee shop, right? They're using at least some geotechnologies for routing themselves through a city. And they're using some satellite imagery, they're using some maps, they're using some directional uh, uh, um, uh, aspects okay to find things they don't always use it in a analytical way but at least they're using some of it so it's not completely a foreign topic to them people know about google maps they know about google earth for example they know about gps on their phone now, turn location services on yes okay so and the geotechnologies having evolved to the cloud i think is a huge leap forward for um geospatial so in the past when michael and ashok and i would want to share data for example it was really clunky um, it was really hard for us to share a big satellite image of Houston or a big flood map or, uh, you know what I mean? It was like, oh, it's too big to email. Can we put it on a server somewhere? Do we have physical media? And now that it's in, that's largely in the cloud, it's, it's not only good to share data, but it allows people to collaborate across disciplinary boundaries. GIS is all about, I think, in higher education, breaking down some of those interdisciplinary uh, boundaries that, uh, or those disciplinary boundaries that have existed for so long and for some of the, for some legitimate reasons, right? For management of the university, you know, how do we divide people up into, into segments and, you know, staffs and, and so on, department chairs and all that. And it's not all a bad thing. It's actually largely good. But the, the, as you know, one of the negative consequences is that we get so busy in our own little you know cluster it's like ooh, work with the sociologists across campus or work with the facilities managers uh, i'm too busy uh, but gis helps break down some of those uh, walls and then finally you know citizen science having students for example on hcc's campus collect every tree every light pole every recycling bin every uh, ada compliant ramp uh, etc is really powerful and they're doing that globally it's not just on university campuses so having ordinary citizens collect data on these things and also bird species um you know uh the quality of of the sidewalk in my community etc citizen scientists have been doing that since you know the late 1800s with the Audubon Society and other uh, natural resource groups but now you can make a map from that data and so that's a really exciting development. And then finally, storytelling with maps, using story maps. This presentation right here, this is actually a story map. It's not a Prezi, it's not a PowerPoint. So inside here, I can actually have things like a photograph. I can have a web map in it. I can have uh, other things. So here's an interactive, you know, live interactive web map from this web-based geotechnology stuff that I'm talking about. So it's a Story maps are a really good communication tool for students and also a good way for instructors to assess the quality of the students work when they present in a story map. It could be shared with their whole class. It could be shared with their instructor. It could be shared with the whole world, actually. So it's pretty exciting uh, time. Let me skip to the next five things because just being sensitive to your time here, one of the things that I wanted to mention is five key trends in geospatial technology that, you know, you might argue with these trends and that's fine. These are my own, um, my own vote, okay? I've got a one-person voting operation here, but I believe that these are important. And, you know, we could debate whether I left off one or you think I should have put another one in there, and that's fine. But 3D, so for example, um, we've got uh, this kind of take capability of um, inside our geographic information systems environment. We've always had 3D visualization, but lately we've been able to actually do 3D analytics. So for you folks that are over in facilities, you wanna be able to look at things like underground and you wanna be able to look at different floors of buildings. And that touches on the second piece, and that is building information management, CAD, computer-aided design or computer-aided drafting, and then the um, architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Back a couple years ago, the, the sort of the, the GIS world and the and the CAD world got together with a meeting between Autodesk's CEO and ESRI's president, Jack Dangerman. They got together and said, you know, it doesn't make sense that we've been sort of in these separate worlds. We've got to be able to integrate CAD and BIM with GIS. And so we're starting to see tools that do that. For example, um, ArcGIS indoors. And of course, that makes sense to, I think, all of you in facilities because it's like, well, hey, if there's an incident at 2 p.m. on a Friday, maybe there's a tornado, or maybe there's a, I don't know, something happens on campus, traffic exit, whatever. Where are the students at 2 p.m. on a Friday? 
in your typical semester when students are actually on campus, right? And it changes every semester, right? As your classes change, as your students change. So, okay, uh, where are the emergency exits, where are the shelters, et cetera, right? And so it's, it's, it's really good that we're starting to see some integration of these things. And also real time data and analytics. What's the stream gauge right now in the bayou down the street from HCC? What is the wildfire perimeter right now in this fire in California? What is the, uh, the current situation with COVID, et cetera? People want data in real time increasingly nowadays, not just traffic, but all sorts of data. And that's coming in from these internet of things enabled devices that increasingly have a latitude longitude associated with them. And then enterprise, what I mean by that is GIS used to be sort of this niche little technology that was, oh, you know, if you want a map or you want some geospatial analysis, go down the hall on a, on a university campus like yours and go see those people. They, they, they can get you the data. But increasingly, it's being viewed as a, as a campus-wide asset, which is really exciting. Ditto for Harris County. Ditto for the city of Houston. I mean, it's being viewed as everybody needs to have access to this and also provide data to input into it. All the water mains, all the, the, the traffic counts, all of the police incidents, et cetera, all in one common framework that people can access and make wiser decisions with. And then the whole advent of this being on the web, which I'll explain more in a bit if we have time. Then finally, artificial intelligence and machine learning, that's, that's becoming huge in GIS. And it's going to alter um, the entry level jobs and other jobs, but let's focus just on the jobs that your students could get in this. In the past, as Michael uh, and Ashok and I uh, have discussed in the past, a lot of students, they would get jobs that frankly were a bit, they were a bit tedious. That's kind of like the entry level GIS job. You had to digitize all the parcels for a big county in Texas, or, or you had to maintain the street network uh, or the water mains or something. You know, that's all necessary stuff. Someone has to put that data in there so other people can use it. Um, but now with, with things like um, uh, artificial intelligence, picture a video, your typical video, you know, the webcam on the on a front of a car uh, or on a, on a city uh, vehicle, and it's collecting a video of that street or those set of streets. Well, what if through AI and machine learning, we can capture every time that video sees a light pole, that's a light pole, it's this high, it's in this condition, that's a curb, it's, this, it's, it's in this condition, that's a tree, it's this species, it's in this, oh, we need to repave this section of street. Okay, so that's, it's all being gathered uh, from these machine learning uh, algorithms from a single video. So therefore, uh, that data, it's truly the big data world that we're in, that data becomes part of the, the geographic information system of that county, that city, City, that municipality, et cetera. And the people that uh, are in that organization do not have to actually hand digitize or hand encode all of that data. Really exciting development. Okay, last group of five that I wanted to share uh, with you all. And that is, I believe these are five skills for your students uh, in GIS, but beyond. But I, I always encourage them to be curious, you know, ask good questions. That is key. GIS is really about this tool. Yeah, it's great to be able to know how to geocode and buffer and overlay maps and things like that. But thinking is the best thing to encourage your students to keep asking questions, be curious about the world. And so that's going to drive them forward in learning the software in developing their, their uh, other tools. And also being able to work with data. GIS is a system and so it involves working with images and vector data and tiles and GPS files and all kinds of different things, live feeds, yeah, software as a service, data as a service. So being able to work with data and also being critical of it. And that's why I have this spatial reserves data blog that you might want to look at at some point because it's all about, hey, there's, there's a, we have the ability at our fingertips to pull in, for example, in ArcGIS.com, for, sorry for the big fingers here, my camera is right by where my keyboard is in this particular device. But let's say I go to ArcGIS.com, which is a cloud-based geographic information system, and then I go to map. Okay. I'm not even signing in. I'm just going to go to map to get to give you a, a short demo. Okay. So what about this? What if we go over to Houston, for example, your part of the world? Okay, great. What about a base map that comes from uh, citizen science? Well, okay. Uh, that would be the uh, open street map in here, which is right here. Okay. So that's a crowdsourced base map layer. Okay. Well, what can else can I, 
like, what can I add to this? I'm going to modify the map. I'm going to add. I'm going to search for layers. And let's say I've got an assignment where I'm going to cite a certain business or I'm going to cite a service. And I want to know what the median age is of different neighborhoods, for example, in um, in the Houston area. So let's say I'm going, to, I'm going to look at the data. I'm going to look at the metadata and find out who created it and how often it was updated from the American Community Survey, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm making a decision, you know, rather in brief format here. But now I've got this map. Okay, I've got two variables in this map. I've got the median age in these colors, and then I've got the median age of the total population. Okay, so I've got the, the size. I've got the median age represented twice. The total population in this particular census tract, so the bigger circles are more people in that census tract. The smaller circles, circles are, are less people in that census tract. So if I zoom into a place like Houston, uh, as you might expect, you've got a younger population in Houston and in many other cities, right? We've got an older population in the rural areas for various reasons, with lots of exceptions, as you can see here. But the point is, where did the data come from? Who created it? And how did they create it? How often is it updated? What's scale was it created at and so on. So this is just in ArcGIS Online. Within a few moments, I had a, a decent map that I can actually use here and I can go over to Houston Community College. And uh, depending on which one, are you at 3100 Main Street? No, no, this one is at... Uh... No, go ahead and use 3100 Main. Okay. okay. That's where most of the people on the call are at. <laughs> All right, sweet. So you're right. Oh, you're right. Uh, you're just southwest of the main downtown. Yeah, interesting. So yeah. now <laughs> I want to change the um, the base map. I'm going to pick a light gray canvas because I don't want a whole lot of background clutter uh, and streets. So now I've got this where I can see that, okay, here it's 30. According to this data set, we always have to say according to this data set. So I've got, you know, thinking about, you know, all the alumni networks and the and the student retention and all that kind of analytics that you folks want to do over there. Okay, this is immediately in your surrounding area, right? In your neighborhood, it's as I would have thought and you would have thought, okay, it's a little bit younger than, for example, just to the uh, north east of you in central downtown, it's a little bit older. And then if we go out to the west central, part of the city, it's even older yet. It's 54. So why is that? You know, maybe I could look at median income. Maybe I could look at other variables. All I have to do is hit this add button and I can search for layers. The point I'm making here is within a moment or two, we actually had a map with some data in it. And this is an open platform. So anybody can contribute data to this platform. You, your students, your faculty, me, anyone. There's no S3 data police saying you cannot put data in this platform. So that means that your students need to be, and all of you, myself included, need to be critical consumers of data, especially map data. Maps have this sort of air of authenticity. They, they look like they were created because of all these wonderful symbols we have at our fingertips by authoritative agencies, and many times they are, you know, USGS, World Health Organization, CDC, State of Texas, DOT, et cetera. Uh-huh, TCEQ, et cetera. But um, the point is anybody besides those mapping and science agencies can create data in this platform too. So all that is to say, that's why I have this spatial reserves data blog that uh, is all about location privacy. How do I get data? How do I know if it's any good, et cetera, okay? So last bits on our five uh, skills and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll you know, we'll, we'll need to, have a chat, but know your geos geospatial and geotechnical foundations. It's still important that some students know a lot about GIS. It's also important in my view that all students know a little bit of geo geotechnologies or GIS. But for those students that really need to be well grounded, like they're going into being a natural resource planner or et cetera, they need to know about the shape of the earth and geodesy and measurement and all that stuff that Ashok dealt with for decades that uh, we really need accurate measurements. If you're laying a gas pipeline, you need to be down to the sub centimeter, right? As accurate, as precise as possible for census tracts that we were looking at. Hey, that's not that critical, but for many applications, right? You need to have a high precision. And so we measure all those based on our concept of the shape of the earth. And that is all from geodesy and geodetic uh, engineering. So also be adaptable. Uh, I think it's important for students to, to kind of think outside their own disciplinary comfort zone 
and um, be, be willing to go outside your community. Be willing to go international. The GIS is in use and is needed all over the world. Hey, maybe it's their opportunity to, to get out there uh, even outside the country and have good communications. Um, presenting their arguments, using data um, as part of their argument, saying, okay, according to the data I analyzed, right? And you want them to be looking at data, okay? And looking at sources and being critical of the sources and citing their sources, right? Even in the term papers that you have them write. So, uh, and again, this whole framework that I'm giving this presentation in is something called a story map, storymaps.arcgis.com. Okay, let me show you one additional thing and then let's, we're gonna get into the heart of uh, especially uh, facilities management and some of the things, the alumni and other, other things that you folks have, have, have questions about. I have, a, I have a column called the Geo Inspirations column in Directions Magazine. And uh, in here, I feature people that uh, are really making a positive difference in our world, including Ashok Wadwani. I featured him in issue in here as well. Um, uh, they're right here. Awesome. But another, another group of people that I have uh, in here featured, and this comes out every, every two months or so in Directions Magazine. So it's a, I think it's a good thing for your students to kind of look at, okay, who, wh where could I work? What kind of stuff do people do with this technology? I think this is a good gallery. And it's about four years of, of, of interviews. Some are podcasts and some are just text. Uh, the one with Ashok and Issue is a podcast. It was a lot of fun. Anyway, one of the people that's, that's in here is a facilities manager and it's Michelle Ellington. And so she's at the University of Kentucky and the University of Kentucky is not the only university that has really embraced this in terms of using GIS, CAD and BIM in their facilities operation. There are others, but she's one of, the, one of my favorite people in this. And so you can read a little bit more about why she's doing what she's doing and how she recruits and hires uh, interns, but also when they graduate, actually has them working in her facility. Now, University of Kentucky is a big place. They, they um, obviously can have, you know, multiple staff people working on, but she's got every single, you know, fiber optic cable, sewer line, water line, electrical line mapped and in this, this system, this facilities management system, which is very keenly attached to their campus-wide geographic information system. So it's in 3D and 2D, it's updated continuously, and um, I could say many more wonderful things about it. But um, anyway, that's, that's something to take a look at. Okay, now I've talked a lot and I hope I'm not boring you to tears and people are checking text messages and things like that. Hopefully you're like, oh yeah, Joseph, this sounds fascinating. And Michael and Ashok have been, been right. I mean, they, this is really the future of, of many organizations. So how can I get more into this? So how can I be of any assistance for you folks? Is this, is this resonating with um, what you came to the meeting to hear about? Michael, it's more your call. You're you're the front front man now. You know, I'm getting behind. You know, Joseph, can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it was very challenging. What I mean, I didn't know a lot of things which has taken place too <laughs> because I lost touch in a way. But I think Michael, that should be good for the students if we can share with them. Oh yeah, I've already started sharing a lot of this stuff from Geo Inspirations. Good. So I'm kind of hoping that the rest of these guys on the call here might have some questions that you can answer. Um, they're just sitting here with their mics muted, so I don't know. Yeah, no worries, no worries. <laughs> uh, Actually, I'll unmute. I'll unmute. It's interesting. Um, I'm Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Thank you so much for um, for doing this for us today. You know, oh, one thing that's interesting pleasure. is the stories <laughs> about um, how people are using, um, like the Geo Inspirations, how people are doing this. Because as we come in and think about um, where do we want to go and where do we want to prioritize, I think starting from the ground up, it's really um, interesting to see what others have done. Yeah, and, and I think it, it would be a really happen. great thing for HCC to be a real leader. A, a lot of times people think, Oh, you know, it's just the big state universities that, that, that can do a lot with geospatial technologies, but 
you know, Michael and Ashok and I, we really firmly believe that, you know, this is a place where, where the community college, um, specifically HCC, can show some real leadership that the university say, look what HCC is doing. Why aren't we doing that at UT? Why aren't we doing that at Texas State, et cetera? Uh, mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you're a, you've got your own challenges, but I think in some ways you're a bit more nimble than some of these big, you know, massive universities like uh, the Ohio State University, et cetera. I mean, sure, they're doing GIS. They've got a GIS department, et cetera, but some of them aren't actually doing that much throughout the campus. It's been sort of niche in GIS, you know, geography, environmental mm -hmm. studies, which is good, but, you know, we're all about, and that's where I think the community well, colleges also, can, get, can get it out there. Yeah. It's also um, very advantageous for HCC to be the lead on this because inside of our HCC district, we have several universities like Rice University, Texas State, excuse me, Texas Southern, um, St. Thomas, U of H, U of H downtown, U of H Clear Lake, Clear Lake yep. all of those places, not one of them have GIS as a component, it's a component in like geology but they don't focus solely on GIS and how we can get that out to show the community what we do and what GIS can do for the community. We don't even have a geography department in most of those universities. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a lost subject. Yeah. And I, I think that's, you're bringing yeah, up I mean, a good I point and you're all about workforce development I mean, that's been a traditional, you know, strength of the community colleges. You're all about getting those students into key positions in industry, government, nonprofits. And so, you know, with, with geospatial technology, if I'm reading the tea leaves right, after this current crisis is over, a lot of other organizations are going to be saying, you know, those dashboards we looked at for months, we need to be doing that kind of stuff. Where does all that come from? And so I think the the interest in geospatial is going to, again, you know, I can't fully predict the future, but I I suspect that it's it's going to is as strong as it's been for the last fifty years. It's just going to take off after all this is over because people are going to realize, yes, that really was a a, a technology that helped people make smarter decisions and helped whole communities plan for a better, more resilient future. Sorry, I interrupted somebody. I didn't mean to. No, I said one of the things that we that's a little bit different from uh, than us than many of the four years is our spatial is the spatial um, component to what we do, how we do it, and where we travel. We cover. I hear, and um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys can tell me whether this is right that we're roughly half the size of Rhode Island, regardless of whether that's true. We're huge. Um, we have seven colleges, oh, and students travel from college to college. We have different programs at different colleges. And just when we started graphing their movement a little bit, and I don't mean graphing on a graph, but I mean just using, you know, thinking about where they were versus where they were going to class and where we might be able to shuttle and things like that, the mm -hmm. spatial components and the um, ability to serve our students better if we understood more their motion, their location, their interest in terms of shuttles, stuff like that is... Um, you know, it would be really useful for us. Yeah, uh, that would, good that point. Would, that, that's mainly a network analysis. And we can, let's talk about that later. <laughs> yes, we can. But, I, you know, yeah, definitely. Uh, for you folks, it, it, I think there's some folks on here in facilities. So let me just mention, there's ArcGIS Indoors, which is a, um, a, tool that connects to 2D and 3D maps that allows people to manage their facilities. So that's one thing to look at. In Esri land, you know, the, the, the folks that I work for, it's kind of like McDonald's in the sense that, you know, McDonald's, everything starts with mix something, or at least most things. In, in, in the world of ESRI or Esri, GIS, most things start with ArcGIS, which is our our flavor, our brand of GIS that actually started in 1969. So most things start with ArcGIS. And I can get into more details about why that is in a bit, but you're probably not interested. No worries. But the point is um, ArcGIS Indoors is a 3D uh, analytical tool. We also have something um, that you might be interested in, especially given your urban setting there, is ArcGIS Urban. And this is a cloud-based um, 
city planning tool. The nice thing about this is that, you know, being cloud-based, just like the ArcGIS online that I showed earlier, there's nothing to install, right? It works on any device. As long as you've got some, and many of these tools actually work offline as well, but as, if you've got some internet connectivity uh, and any device, anytime, anywhere, you can actually start, okay, I want to plan a new bike lane on this street. How do I plan that? How do I get that implemented? Or a, a light rail line, or I'm going to plan this new, new uh, tower on right next to HCC. Maybe there are some height restrictions right next to HCC. I'm just making this up, but um, okay, which, which parts of the neighborhood are going to be in shadow if I build this 10 story tower? Uh, and, and is that okay? Okay, so then you could have the community say, okay, and, and inside uh, urban, you can say, okay, here's the design of the tower, and this is the different times of the year and different times of the day that these, these neighborhoods around it are going to be in shadow. That kind of stuff is what you can use uh, as a teaching tool, as a research tool uh, with students, uh, not just in planning, but in other disciplines, but largely centered on, in this case, uh, urban design, urban planning. So those are just a couple of things to mention. The other, the last one I wanted to mention, just because I know you folks are into, you know, analyzing data, is something called ArcGIS Insights. And Insights really comes at uh, this whole notion of analytics from the data side. You know, a lot of us come into this from, we love maps, we love satellite images, we love 3D maps, you know, so we come into this from the mapping side, but there's a whole host of, of, of data analysts. And indeed, as you know, in, in a lot of campuses nowadays, they're starting these data science programs. So a lot of students, you know, a lot of folks in society, they're, they, they love numbers, and they start with spreadsheets and databases. And so, you know, this is really, this kind of tool is designed for the, you know, the spatial statistics and the regular statistical group, you know, there's a whole R st stats community, right? There's a, SA, a SAS stats community, uh, you know, Stata, et cetera, these other statistical packages. And so the people that come into it from, you know, the, the Tableau people, the people that come into this from, oh, I love analyzing data. And oh, by the way, I can make maps with this too. Wow, cool. I never thought about that. So it's, it's from that side rather than from the mapping into the analytics. It's from the analytics into the mapping. And so using both of those in, in tandem, really exciting. So that's ArcGIS Insights. I promised that was the last tool, but let me, can I show you one more? Go for it. Okay. And that's something, I'm actually going to give you a little live demo of Business Analyst Web. So Business Analyst Web, I'm thinking about, you know, your recruitment and retention efforts. This is a business tool that's used out there in the business world, but it's also great for students to use and for you uh, thinking about, okay, where are we going to recruit, uh, you know, new students from in the future, that type of thing. Now, in this case, and this would be uh, uh, in your S3, you know, site license that you've got, you're going to actually have to sign in to use, so you sign into your ArcGIS online account, which I'll do right here, and forgive the big fingers here, folks, but um, anyway, what, what Business Analyst Web is, it's, it's, it, it's cloud-based, so again, nothing to install, you know, Mac, PC, tablet okay what you can do with it is you can make maps as you probably would expect you can do you can create infographics which have a variety of pie charts bar charts etc uh, you can also map businesses and you can map consumer expenditures and behaviors so who goes to the symphony who buys lottery tickets who is who, who has gone to a four-year institution or a two-year college institution in the last six months. Those are the kinds of things that are in here. And those things are not actually from census data. They're from uh, consumer surveys and also from credit card purchases. So there's a wealth of data in here. And I'll just open one, one uh, uh, thing here that, okay, let's say we want to, and notice up in the upper, this is what's great about this for research. There's multiple countries in here. It's not just the USA. Now, sure, depending on the data that we can actually obtain, purchase, et cetera, from different statistical agencies and private companies around the world, um, you know, there's going to be a varying amount of detail uh, in here. I mean, you're not going to be able to get neighborhood, you know, consumer expenditures for North Korea. But the point is, you're going to be able to get a lot of data from a lot of different countries. So know that. But also, let's say we go, okay, well, let's just look at your region, for example, I want to make a quick map of kind of like what we did in ArcGIS online. But this time, I'm going to I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to say, hmm, let's say I am, um, I'm going to cite a new kind of business. 
So one of the things that I want to do is I'm going to create a map. And notice I can do these color-coded choropleth maps like median age, median income, things like that. But I can also do a business and facilities search. So we've got millions of businesses in here, and you can search by the uh, NAICS code, by the SIC, Standard in Industry Classification Code, and some other methods. I'll just, I'll just do that. Let's go ahead and, and map some businesses. Okay, what kind of businesses do I want to map? Let's say I'm gonna, I've got a, an assignment to the students to cite a new um, – how about a convenience store? So I'm going to look at convenience stores. And let's go ahead and, and search for that. Okay, so now I've got a cluster map. No, it, no, no surprise in your area, there's a lot of convenience stores. In this particular zone right here, there's 36 of them. There's seven out here, there's 10 out here. I don't have to map it by clusters. So let's say I just, let's say my student that I'm giving this assignment to, uh, I'm gonna say to that student, okay, you're working for Circle K. So I only want the Circle Ks. And so your manager says, you need to cite a new Circle K. So you need to look at the competition. You need to look at the uh, consumer habits and expenditures and so on and so forth. But let's just keep it simple for right now. I'm just going to say the Circle K and I'm going to go next. And here's where I don't have to cluster. Notice I can, I can uncheck this and now I actually have the locations for these things and I can change the symbol if I want to. Uh, okay, so that's good. And I'm done. So now I've got, uh, okay, these are the actual business locations of these things. And there's that one right there. Now, if I zoom to that, let's say I want to change the base map really quickly. So I'm going to scoot the zoom chat box around and I'm going to change the base map. So I really want to look at the site for that one. What does it look like yeah, actually on the ground? So I'm going to change it to the base map and then I'm going to, then I'm going to zoom in on that thing and and wow, look, I can see where the gas pumps are underneath the awning uh, because it's hot in Texas, right? You got to have these things under a, some sort of shelter. Um, so anyway, the point is, okay, this looks like a residential area. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Uh, you know, there are pros and cons, right, to citing these things. But let's say I'm going to create some buffers now. Okay, now the, the whole concept of threshold, I think, is important for students to understand in lots of different disciplines, but just taking the uh, business case for right now, people are willing to travel less, right, for a convenience store, a uh, medium for a Home Depot or something like that, and maybe a longer distance for something like an Ikea. So I'm in Denver right now, and uh, we considered ourselves, ooh, we've hit the big time about eight years ago when we got our first Ikea. You probably have several in Houston, right? But getting one in Colorado was a big deal. So people are willing to travel, you know, two, three hours to go to the Ikea store. Okay, so different thresholds. But for a convenience store, eh, if I made a one, three, and five mile drive time or ring, or let's take rings, a ring, they're going to be circles. I like to have the students actually articulate what's it going to look like when I'm done with this. And if I take the drive time, though, probably not 15 minutes. I don't know if I drive 15 minutes to one of these, but maybe three, five, and seven is my threshold for a convenience store. So I'm going to ask the students, okay, what's that shape going to look like? So if I zoom out now, I'm going to see the, the three, five, and seven minute drive time and it's going to be impacted by the freeway network that you have the streets right the traffic the light the number of light traffic lights etc so it's an oblong shape so i can actually get pretty pretty far away on this freeway depending on the time of day of course but i can also see that okay if i map the next one over where is the overlap between my circle k and the next circle k and then what about the competition and is there any gap in houston where there's actually a, a seven minute big big hole in, inside Houston where, okay, one of these might be useful. And maybe another variable that I would want to add is the, the, the behavior information that we'll talk about in a minute. But before we get there, I'm going to create an infographic just for that three, five, seven minute um, zone. So let's, again, you're not, you're not citing convenience stores and you're, you're not using this in instruction maybe, but maybe you're using this in research. Like, for example, how, what's our catchment area for HCC students at our different campuses? And do they overlap? And where can we recruit more or less in maybe the local high schools or in the technical colleges surrounding you or whatever it is? You've got this ability to customize, not just create these infographics that you see here, but actually customize what goes into each, each of these boxes. So you can say, ooh, who has a, ooh, this is interesting, education. What is the education level of that, of that uh, zone, the three, five, and seven-minute um, drive times around that site. 
So, okay, now that we know how to create an infographic, let's do one more thing. And hopefully this is intriguing too, because it kind of relates to what we were talking about before. I'm going to change the base map off of a satellite image. I'm going to change it back to streets. Okay. And then I'm also going to create a map because I want to show you just a sample of the kind of variables that's inside this system. So color coded map. And in this case, I'm going to scoot these uh, uh, zoom boxes around. But this kind of time I wanna say, you know, one of the things that the convenience stores, for example, are, are keen on, and it, you know, there's other products too, but, but one of them is you probably have seen, if you've been in one ever, is lottery tickets. They're really front and center, they're right at the counter. And um, I've never actually bought one, but, but that's one of the key draws for a convenience store. So gosh, look what we've got in here. Bought a lottery ticket at, the, at a convenience store in the last 30 days. Buy census tract, buy zip code, buy block group. What do we have here under leisure activities? Oh my gosh, look at this. I played lottery, I bought a lottery. There's all kinds of granularity in here, it's amazing. So this is another nice teachable moment. What's the raw number? versus the percentage versus the index. I'm gonna take the index because it's gonna normalize it by uh, the national average is gonna be 100 in the index. I don't want raw numbers because I'm, I don't wanna be influenced by the total number of people in that neighborhood because it might be disparate uh, in different neighborhoods. So I'm gonna say index and then I'm gonna grab that layer and I'm just gonna be mapping this one, this one variable and now I can see, oh, in, this, in these neighborhoods here that are darker reddish, they are higher than the national average uh, for buying a lottery ticket. Okay, so maybe that will influence my uh, sighting, for example, of the convenience store. Again, your variables for your HCC study will, will be different, right? Who has maybe a family member that has, that has attended higher education? Who is willing to travel? Who is, uh, you know, who's who's bought books, I, I don't know, you, you pick the variables, but, but there's a lot at your fingertips here. And just one more thing, if we, if we actually, we're gonna close that and go back to our layers over here on the left side, because let's say I want now, I want to filter this. I only want the, the neighborhoods that are above 100. Remember, and I can't quite put that, that bar at 100, so I'm gonna type in 100, okay? So there's 100, and that means that everything that's on this map right here at this level, and again, thinking critically about data, this, these are block groups. So these are the finest level of geography that you can obtain this kind of data for. You're not going to be able to get individuals, right? Not what I bought, what you bought, it's all aggregated. But the point is here, we've got this really interesting pattern where, hey, maybe this part of Houston and down here and so on, there are certain neighborhoods where they're more prone to buying lottery tickets. And maybe, maybe there's another couple of variables we want to look at. Um, you know, uh, uh, this is just for one application, but this is all part of community analyst slash business analyst web, which is a tool that you actually have at your fingertips. And then of course you can save this, you can share this, you can say, hey, you know what? I wanna make a story map. Joseph talked about story maps, so share results. I wanna make a, um, an interactive map with text and audio and video that tells about the study that I'm working on. And I can make a PDF if I want. I can also share it into this ArcGIS cloud. So hopefully that was of interest. Uh, I think this is a fascinating uh, tool right here that you might be able to actually use in different departments on campus for, for, for research and also for instruction. Very interesting, Joseph, very interesting. I wish I could get excited about this. I'm already excited. <laughs> well, just to let you know, we actually teach business analysts and insights. And one I figured. <laughs> so I'm not surprised. There. And then more importantly, you were talking about shadow mapping based on uh, we actually do that in our raster class where we do shadow mapping. We're actually trying to find, I actually have them try to find a good place for a, uh, a break picnic tables so they don't get cold in the winter and they don't boil in the summer. So that's one of the exercises there. And then we also do, uh, one of the things that I like to do is uh, <clears throat> line of sight and uh, visibility analysis. Mm -hmm. For cell phone towers because you know we did have the Super Bowl here a few years ago and Verizon did a whole bunch of visual analysis for new cell phone towers to increase 
the capacity the capacity of the system with all these people coming to town for the Super Bowl. So students find that rather rather interesting. <laughs> Well, I salute you. Those are great applications and they show the diversity of scales and themes and, and problems that people are trying to solve with this. So I think it's great to expose students to a lot of different kinds of things. Now you folks um, on the call here, do you have specific questions that came to mind for me? I mean, I, you know, I, I think you can probably sense that, um, uh, you know, Michael and Ashok and I, we, we can go on and on about uh, the benefits of geotechnologies, but if you've got some specific questions, that, uh, that's what we're here for. Uh, this is Martha, and, and hey, Martha. one of the challenges that we're facing right now is uh, the uh, is access of our students to um, internet. Mm -hmm. We have some internet deserts in with our students, and so we can give them laptops, but if they don't have access to internet, uh, it doesn't do them a whole lot of good. And it's not only us; it's also the K twelve folks. Yeah, good point. Uh, in fact, uh, that is a variable uh, that you can access through this platform is, yeah, internet access uh, down to the neighborhood level. Um, yeah, uh, here's something that might be of interest. Um, I was just telling uh, Michael and uh, Ashok about this. Uh, we have a series of mapping hour uh, videos that we're producing. Uh, they're primarily for primary and secondary schools. Uh, parents and teachers, but I think they're actually, um, uh, they could be useful for others because, for example, today, the reason why I was bringing this up now is, okay, this is a series of hour-long mapping hour videos on how do I make a story map? How do I do analysis in ArcGIS Online? How do I go out in the field and collect data with Survey123? So those are the kinds of things that other people, including university students, college students, uh, might want to know about as well. But the reason why I bring it up right now is because um, there are certain tools that are able to be taken offline. And that's exactly what our episode today was about that we recorded uh, is, okay, I wanna collect data in the field. I don't have internet access. Oh, how do I do that? So how do I save those maps, for example, to my own device, go out in the field and collect data uh, onto it? So anyway, uh, but it's a good point though. Uh, a lot of this cloud-based stuff is you gotta have not just internet access, but actually a halfway decent connection. And so, um, yeah, that's been a challenge. For sure, no, nothing, uh, you know, nothing you folks don't know. Um, you know, it, I don't pine for the old days of just desktop only, but we do have desktop tools that you can run without connecting to the cloud. ArcGIS Pro that I'm sure Michael uses as well. Um, that is something that most university and community college students use. It's not something that most secondary students use, but they could. I mean, you know as well as I do that if you have an instructor that lets those students fly, there's no holding them back. Uh, we've seen, you know, pretty young kids using this in meaningful ways. But if the teacher is, oh, I have to, I have to know all of this before I can give it to the students, then that's a that's a that's a challenge. It's it's understandable that they feel that way. But we gotta we got we're trying to encourage them. Hey, you know, your your role is still critical, but you don't have to be the tech guru. A lot of the students will figure this stuff out, but your your role is still important because you're framing the inquiry based questions. You're encouraging them to 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 delve into the spatial relationships and yeah. So we do have ArcGIS Pro that can you can run it in a disconnected mode. But yeah, ArcGIS Online, Community Analyst, they're all cloud based tools that really are not designed to run in a standalone mode. Uh, I mean, sure, there are things you can do to work around it. We can talk more about that. You saw in Business Analyst Web, for example, I can make a PDF of this and I can share that PDF uh, with, with students, okay? I can make, I can, I can save this in a PDF and I can use that for an instructional resource with students. So there's, there's ways to, you know, not completely get around that issue, but there are there are some there are some options. But I, I definitely hear what you're saying. Well, yeah. I was actually thinking of it in more in terms of our own analysis of what's happening with our students rather than uh, the the teaching aspect. But but I guess Michael might be interested in the teaching aspect as well. Yeah, uh, and, and like I said, the, the, that internet access is a variable that comes from the American Community Survey, and you can actually look at the patterns, relationships, and trends. You bet. I was just doing that the other day, actually. In a, in a, in a, I taught a lesson for the, the AAG conference, which was canceled. Uh, you know, moved to the virtual mode. So last week, a number of my colleagues and I taught uh, our the GIS workshops we would have taught at the geography conference, but I taught we all taught them, you know, 
with Zoom basically. And mine was one of mine was about uh, the census and one of the variables I used from the Living Atlas of the World, which is probably another thing I should uh, just uh, briefly mention. It for, in terms of data is internet access. It's a it's a it's one of the variables that uh, you can access in the Living Atlas, Living Atlas of the World. Anyway, very good point though that you're raising. Uh, but you know where to find me, and you know about some of these resources, probably some of them you already knew about, but just to kind of confirm that, you know, Michael isn't, you know, um, the only one saying, you know, this actually matters. Uh, there are others that uh, firmly believe in this, not, be, again, not because of the data, not because of the tools, but just because of the, uh, um, the, 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 the bigger educational goals that we're trying to get across to students. Uh, think critically, think spatially, make wise decisions, be curious, all that stuff that I mentioned. Well, for the, uh, for the people who are online with us, we are migrating them to, uh, well, I say migrating. There's a couple of them that had Arc Desktop. <clears throat> ArcGIS Desktop, they're all going to ArcGIS Pro. Mm -hmm. So we've done a little training on that so far. Um, we're getting the software in their computers so they can do a little playing. They all have access to insights. They all have access to uh, business analysts. So I, I'm just kind of curious about the questions I'll get and see where they try to take this and how we can uh, elevate HCC not only for the institution but for the community. No, that's grand. And I just wanted to mention, the uh, we do have a whole COVID zone in our education geonet space about how do I virtualize the software when students are off site? Um, you know, how do I teach with ArcGIS online if they don't have desktop software and all that stuff. We've got a whole series of, of, uh, you know, strategies and, and, and approaches and not just from us, from our team, we've had a couple of sessions with, uh, you know, your higher education colleagues around the country um, and even outside the country where they, they, we record what they say and we've got them in these, in these, uh, these essays and these uh, short videos. So there's there's a there's a body of, of of resources there that you can tap into if you if you need it. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is getting students out in the field. So you know back when you're uh, you know in in a sort of a mode where you can have you know students go out in the field and collect data. One of the one of the things I'm really passionate about is walkability. So I have a walkability uh, story map that I have students create in this short lesson. Then they create a map. They create a dashboard, like you saw with the COVID dashboard and some other things where you've got pie charts and, and analytics. And then they make a survey, an actual survey that they take out into the field and they say, oh, okay, uh, this, this place is walkable. That place is not walkable. And this place has challenges in walkability. And why do communities care about being walkable or not? And so that is uh, what this particular lesson is all about. So I have them start by, okay, would you consider this walkable? This, this, uh, this sidewalk right here. It's right next to a really busy street. It is a sidewalk, but mm, it's got some challenges, got some, you know, some pavement damage. It's got some snow on it, you know, so think about the walkability of your neighborhood. I've been to Rice University, beautiful campus. I know you're not too far from there. So uh, I'd love to come down and see you all. Hopefully uh, we'll make that happen like we were going to uh, today. Actually, it was the day I was going to be there, but hopefully this is this is the next best thing. And uh, perhaps we can talk about, you know, the fall semester and um, maybe I could visit you then if it um, fits your needs and meets your, you know, goals and all that good stuff. I know you're busy, but I'd be happy to do that. Oh, we'd, we'd love to have you. Uh, you folks are the real heroes. I'm just the uh, supporting, I'm just the cheerleader. You're the real heroes out there. But again, if there's anything that I and my team can do to um, help you move forward in this, and same with you, Michael, I know you're a champion there, but if there's anything we can do to help support you as well, that's what we're here for. No, I, I think we pretty much got on everything. Um, I'm pretty sure Martha and Andrea and Stan, Stanley's actually a uh, uh, a whiz with GIS, so hopefully he'll move forward into pro and keep going with it. So, yeah, I mean, Mario, he's used GIS before. So yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty confident, you know, going into pro and with these new tools that we'll be able to do everything. I'd like to thank you for you spending some time with us this evening. Oh, it was I'd a like great honor. You this is great. Oh, thanks so much. All right, folks, map on, stay safe. I wish you all the best and, uh, Hope to meet you face-to-face -face in the fall. 
Stay mappy. Uh, thank Indeed. you. Thank you. See you, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, too. Not a problem.